My goal for the afternoon swing training room uh, is going to be from 5 to 6 p.m. This is the second hour of Mentorship Monday. And in regards to swing trading and trading in general, one of the topics that I get the most is this question right here. And this is what we're going to talk about for the next hour or so. Um, and that topic is going to be called, what is the bounce? What is the bounce? Where does it occur? Where does it occur? That's what we're going to be talking about for the next hour. So again, this is Mentorship Monday. This is the only day of the week where I do this, or I'm sorry, the only day of the month. So there's only one Monday every month where I go slow. I kind of discuss and have educational properties throughout the class, and then the rest of the month we're trading full time. Um, I want to talk about this because this is a question that is very often asked. And it's a very easy answer. So I want to kind of discuss and, and talk about uh, what that is and how it works out. Um, Manesh, just shoot me a quick email if you want, and I'll be happy to answer that particular question for you as well. Uh, John says, I don't do day trading, only swing trade options for three, six months. That's fine. Uh, the afternoon room would still be a perfect slot for you, Mr. John. Perfect slot. So what is the bounce and where does it occur? What is the bounce and where does it occur? Let's go through the initial kind of steps when I look for a trade. Does anyone here remember the very first thing I look at when I'm looking at a chart? When I pull up a stock, what's the first thing that I'm looking for? The very first thing is I'm gonna look for, hey, you guys have been to my classes before, I love this. <laughs> I'm looking for the trends. All right, that's the very first thing when I pull up a stock chart, I'm gonna look for the trend or as Joseph Smith the third, which by the way, I miss you, man, how are you? Hope you're doing amazing. Uh, you're gonna be looking for the trends. So give me a stock really quick. Any stock that you guys want, we're looking at American Airlines right now, but uh, John says Alcoa is the first one to type it in. So I'm pulling up Alcoa. What is the trend on the daily chart? Trend is bullish, yep, trend is higher. So once the trend is bullish, you're going to be looking for a bullish trade. The second thing that you want to ask is what is your trading time frame? That's the second question that you should ask. That's going to be an inherent question that you don't necessarily have to ask new in every trade setup, but that is something that you're going to want to know. Are you a day trader? Are you a swing trader? Are you a long-term investor? Are you buy and hold? Like, what is, what is your time frame? What's your goal? Type in a one if you're employed right now. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can also type in a one and post any comments or questions in the section below. But if you are employed, you probably aren't a day trader. You can still be a day trader and be employed, but more than likely, um, you're going to be a swing trader. And the other part is if you are employed, you're employed, that means you have money coming in, hopefully. <laughs> if you're doing it the right way, someone should be paying you money, which means you're the exact opposite of me, right? I don't have anyone paying my bills. Uh, so if you're self-employed, it's a whole different thing, right? But if you are employed, as Joseph says, <laughs> we get paid. Exactly, you should be. So from that standpoint, right, if you are employed, you don't have to worry, you don't have to worry about money coming in. So your time frame should be longer, two to three months max. Well, I shouldn't say max, two to three months approximately. So if you are already working, and you're already having money come in, you already have a job, you already have employment, whatever the process is, your time frame, in my opinion, could be easily two to three months, somewhere around that time frame. If you want to do longer, that's absolutely fine. But the reason a two to three month time frame is good is because that's about how long it takes for a good move to come in. Obviously, you can do really fast moves like this right here in Alcoa. You can have solid, solid bursts of energy. But over time, your goal is to grow an account. And you don't have to trade for an income 
So simply be more patient and understand that in trading, less is more. If you take one really good trade a month, one really good trade a month, it doesn't really matter what your account size is, and you make an additional $1,000 a month. And honestly, it really doesn't not matter what your account size is. It could be $1,000, it could be 10,000, 5,000, 100,000. If you just make one really good trade a month, you make a thousand bucks, that's pretty decent, right? If you already have an extra job, you already have money coming in, that's an additional amount of money that you can do whatever you want to with, right? Are you paying off debt? That's my suggestion is to start paying off debt, whatever that debt might be. Um, credit cards, car payments, student loans, take that money out and you, you know pay the debt. If it's in an IRA or something where you can't take the money out, okay, keep growing it, no big deal. Daniel says property tax, yep, you can pay property taxes so you don't end up like Nicolas Cage. Alice says you can pay your local bookie. If you're a gambler, you can also do that. But that is, a two to three month time frame is really pretty normal for most of my traders. And you only need to take one or two really good trades a month. Now, it depends on what your R is and, your, and, and the size of your R. But when I talk about one really good trade, it's still gonna come down to number three. So number three is going to be in, invest in what you know. Trade what you know. So if you pull up a company and it's like a random biotech pharmaceutical company that you've never traded before in your entire life, you can take that trade if you want, no harm, no foul, but it's usually much better to take a trade in what you know. It's better to invest in something that you know. So if it's Budweiser, Apple Computers, Intel, Netflix, uh, Procter & Gamble, Johnson Johnson, Energy Stock, whatever it might be. So you trade in what you know. That usually amplifies your success rate. Remember, you do not have to trade everything out in the sun. You can do very, very well just trading one company a month, one stock a month. That's all you focus on, just one company. And you can trade the hourly charts, you can trade the daily charts, the weekly charts, plenty of opportunities just focusing on one stock, the ups, the downs, the intermediate, things like that. So. Investing in what you know usually will keep you in the trade a little bit longer because you like the company, correct? And if you're trading shares, uh, again, it should be even easier to stay in the company a little bit longer than you might. And especially if they're paying dividends. So if the stock pays dividends, then there's even more reason for you to be in the trade even longer at that particular point. So if you invest in what you know, it'll keep you in trades just a smidge longer. And that's kind of the goal. Um, Asha, so Jeremy, if one's not day trading, is there still value in joining the trading room? Uh, I would say yes, because we have a swing trading room. <laughs> right, so go join that one. If you don't day trade, that's fine. Just join the swing trading room. Uh, Elvis says, any advice for a small account? I do have a lot of advices for a small account. How to grow a small account. I'll send you a video, Elvis. I got a video on everything, man. I've already thought about it for you guys. I already know what you're gonna want, what you struggle with, what you need help with. I've already been there. I've bought the t-shirt, I've written the book, hey, I sold everyone. the book. My name is Jeremy Alexander Newsom, and I'm the CEO of Real. Sorry, I was going, my, my computer's like lagging. I don't know why. So this is the one I'll send you. This is a little bit of a longer version. Okay, so I'll post that in the chat pane. Um, so, to grow a small account, there you go, Elvis, there's a lot of details in that particular video. Now, third, so we're talking about, you figure out what is the trend, you figure out what time frame you're investing in, and you figure out, do you know the company, do you know the stock? Um, fourth, number four, look for support and resistance. That's number four, very simple. Just go look for your support and resistance lines. And once you draw those lines, it creates what's called your framework. 
Now, when you are creating your framework, so if I zoom out here on Alcoa, uh, and this is actually, John, a phenomenal, really good example of, of one because we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, what if I could have told you guys uh, a month and a half ago to buy Alcoa right there? Would that have been valuable? Would that have been good to know? The answer is yes. I will send you a really cool chart on Alcoa. And I'll show you for my swing trading fans uh, how I can help you get into these trades because what I do and what I'm very good at, one of the specialties that I have is longer term charting analysis. Longer term, I mean two to three, four months, uh, right? Most trades take more than a day to play out. It's all about patience. It's all about being calm. You're not gonna become a millionaire by Thursday, so just take a deep breath. But here was back on, um, Actually, let me do it this way. So starting August 16th of 2017, this is my chart of Alcoa, and this is me beginning to plan the trade. August 16th. So what I did is I created three lines. You'll notice I said, hey, it could go sideways, it could do the red thing, or it could do the blue pattern. And pretty much what I was saying is it's at a resistance, right? This is my framework. So this is step number four when you're pulling up a chart is draw your support and resistance room or draw your support resistance lines. And once you have those lines, it creates a framework. A framework is your perception of what the stock is doing. A framework is your perception of where you want to buy and where you want to sell. Just like if you were to build a house or, uh, build a tree house for your kids or decorate your house once it's built, a framework is yours. There is no one person that does the correct framework perfectly every time. There is no one person that is the best creator of support and resistances in the world. It is just simply your framework. So if you create a house, you're going to build it the way you want to. When you create a support and resistance lines on a chart, it is your determination of once those lines are there, that is what you should follow. So this was my analysis back in August. I started planning what Alcoa was going to do. I started using my framework. And then over here on December 8th, 2017, I posted this particular chart. Now, you are able to follow me on TradingView for free. So what I was mentioning is I pulled it up and I said, this was the chart, correction, pullback, comma, retest, whatever you want to call it. This green box, this was me saying, this green line, buy the salsa, right? You guys have all heard that term before, right? Buy the dip. This is the retest, this is the bounce, correction, pullback, whatever you want to call it. That's why this particular Mentorship Monday session is called the bounce, because that is just a term. That term you can use for, that, that's just a word. It's just an English word for the stock is coming down into some type of support and literally continuing higher. This move that occurs, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it a pullback, you can call it a retracement, you can call it a, a retest, you can call it a, a wave. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. But it's a retest. So when a stock pulls back into a level, if you want to buy it, this is something that's very important to know. This is the biggest takeaway from, from this particular session. It will feel uncomfortable. Uncomfortable for you to buy the bounce. It's just that simple, my friends. If you are uncomfortable when the stock is pulling back, it's probably a pretty decent time to buy. Because that is the pullback, that is the retest, that is the bounce. The bounce, if you're gonna buy it, happens before most people get in. Right, when most people get into the trade, so again, Alcoa is a phenomenal example, John, you could have picked a better one for me. If I'm looking at the daily chart, what most people do is they'll get in right here, or right when it makes this new high, they'll get in right there or something, right when it breaks out. The, the point of the number one thing to look for is that the trend 
is my friends, if the trend is bullish, that's all the confirmation you need. People use this word confirmation way too loosely because they're looking for everything under the sun to go bullish. This is what you need to find. If the trend, if you can say, yep, this is the trend, and that trend coincides with any other price moving average or anything else that you want to buy it at, that's where you buy. You buy into a support, old resistance becomes a new support zone. So as Alcoa trades down into that level, that is simply where you buy. Joseph says, when we know after the trend is broken, um, after you lose on it four or five times in a row, then you'll know. Once you lose on the same stock four or five times in a row, you go, oh, okay, I think the trend's broken. And then you'll recalculate it and you'll take it from there. Joseph says, dang, is that a bad thing, Joe? Is that bad? He says, 4R, uh, not necessarily. Because you can move up your stop at some point, right? So for example, let me come back. Uh, here's Baidu as an example. So Baidu, um, I'm in this trade, bullish. And what I'm going to do uh, tomorrow is move my stop up to right here. So if the stock trades down to my stop and I get stopped out, I'm going to lose 0.7R approximately. So if you multiply that times four losses in a row, Joe, four times 0.7, that's only 2.8R, which means all you need is one good trade to recover from four losses. Right? John says, does a very strong resistance generally equal very strong support? Yes, sir. So when we're talking about what is the bounce, here is the answer. The bounce occurs at your support levels and resistance levels before any indicator tells you to get in. A bounce occurs before any indicator tells you to get in. The professional traders are the ones who create the bounce. For example, let's say that there are some people who bought right here at the red circle. Let's call them the red traders. Did they make money? Yes or no? They did. Yep. They made money. So when the stock came back down to that price, what do you think they did? The exact same thing. And what did they use? They simply used price. That's all they did. They simply used price. And that price, it worked once, so they did it again, and it worked twice. There is, um, if there's any, very, very few indicators that would have tell you to buy right there at that particular price. The only way you could have bought there is to have your order pre-ready, determined, ready to get in again as the stock is trading down to that level. If you're buying there, what most traders will do is they will wait and they will wait and they will wait and they'll buy right here. And then they'll get stopped out right there only to see the trade go against them again. Type in a two if that's happened to you way too many times. If you're typing in a two, that is because you're waiting too long and it's okay. Guys, trust me. It's the only way I figured this stuff out is because I lost so much flipping money buying at the absolute highest spot and selling at the absolute lowest spot. It just took me forever to figure this out. The answer is you have to get in way earlier, way earlier. You're getting in too long. You're waiting way too long. The best trade is when you feel the most uncomfortable to take it when you have your support resistance, you've determined your trend, and then you simply pick a spot to buy, and then you just buy there. Then you just buy there. So Rick, in this particular situation, um, 254.60 was a little bit high, but you'll notice we got in uh, on this day on a pullback, uh, and I almost sold the next day right here. I almost sold. When that giant shadow came down, I did mention that would probably trade into, um, into that level. 
we had already taken a trade bullish back here, Rick. So you're absolutely correct. Um, but that was way back in December. So at this point, this is just a retest of old resistance, new support. That's what's happening right now on Baidu, hopefully at least, and then it bounces. But yeah, no, you're you're absolutely correct. You're you're 100 right. Um, this is, I mean, if I could go back to December and talk about that, <laughs> I would, you know. But this, we are where we are right now in, in the in the scope of things. So here's Nvidia as an example. This is the best example I can give. The most recent example um, that I can think of off the top of my head. So this blue line at 217.16, this line represents a resistance. This line represents the all the all time high area for Nvidia. Would you guys agree? Pretty simple line to draw, somewhere around 217, 218. Depends on how you drew it. That's like saying if you uh, wore a blue shirt rather rather than a red shirt to a business meeting, it doesn't really matter. If you're if your lines at 217, 16, or your lines at 217, 18, or your lines at 218, or your lines at 217, 3, as long as you get a general idea of where you're having that line, that's perfect. So what type of gap is this on NVIDIA right here? So this was uh, three, four days ago, whatever it was, a week ago. What type of gap is that? It's a retest gap, exactly. So what is the trend? This is the mechanics of the trade, by, by the way, if you will. The trend is bullish. Okay, so we got that down. Type in a seven if most of you like NVIDIA and you know what they do. Now, you don't have to take this trade, but there's, there's, there you go. There's about 100 sevens. So we're covering most of the bases of what we're talking about so far. Uh, type in an, an eight if you know that NVIDIA pays dividends. Okay, cool. So we're already covering most of the bases I just talked about. All right, you find the trend. What's the trend? The trend is bullish. Number two, invest in what you know. Many people know what NVIDIA does. If you don't, it's okay. Don't feel stupid. There's other examples, <laughs> all right? Facebook, Netflix, right? There's plenty of other examples. Um, but they do pay dividends. It's not a huge dividend, but they do pay dividends, right? It's not astronomical, but free money is free money. That's what dividends are to me. That's just free money. So NVIDIA meets all the criteria. So when you create your support resistance, that's step number four. Step number five is find, find the gaps. Let me try to type this in. I don't know why it's not working. Number five is find the gap. Find the gap, find a recent gap and determine what type of gap it is. That will help you with timing the trade. For example, this candle, white candle gapping up, what type of gap is that? Retest gap, exactly. That is a retest gap. Did it retest? There's the retest, right? It pulls back to old resistance, new support. That's where you're buying and there's the bounce. So it's a retest gap. So if you, if you see, right, that's number five, you find the gap. At this point, your job is very easy. Very simple. Number six, determine your entry. Number seven, determine your stop and risk amount. So you already know your risk amount. And that's your R. That's going to be what you want to risk on any given trade. Right, Mike Wilson? That is your R. Your R is your risk amount. Uh, go ahead and type in what your guys' R is. I think you all know my R is 450. Um, go ahead and type in whatever yours is in the chat pane. I'm not going to call it out, but just so that you know what your R is. So your R is 1% of your account is a good R. If you want it to be more, it can be more. If you want it to be less, it can be less. It's totally up to you, but it shouldn't be a lot. Right? Meaning it shouldn't be like 25% of your account. So I got one trader saying an R is 100 bucks for me. That's okay. That's fine. It can be a big number. It can be a small number. It doesn't matter. But if 10, if 1% of your R is whatever it is, that's how much you're willing to risk. Okay, cool. Start there. Kenneth Freeman says, if you hold a security that pays dividend long term, does dividend payments reduce your cost basis? Yes, it does. Great question. 
So now that you know who you guys are, you simply determine your entry and you determine your stop. Now granted, at this part, this is the part that takes a little bit of practice. But I'll tell you guys where your stop should go. If you ever want, want to know, um, here's where your stop should go. If you are bullish, find a good bullish candle and place your stop below there. <laughs> Okay, so that's pretty much a good rule of thumb, if you will, uh, for if you are bullish, where your stop should go. So in this example, can anyone tell me where my entry would be on the trade? The number six, where would the entry be? Any guesses? The entry in this situation is already on the screen. Two, 17, 16, that is my entry. How did I get that number? That is the resistance line of which I drew. All right? Shaw says the retest, exactly. Now, here's the big takeaway from this particular session, right? In this class, I'm talking about what is the bounce. Folks, here's the big, big takeaway, all right? Do I know for sure that the stock will pull back to that price and bounce? Yes or no? And the answer, my friends, is always no. Nothing is for certain in the stock market. It's forecasting like the weatherman, exactly. Do you know for sure that the Patriots will win the Super Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right so you <laughs> the example is you have a plan and from there all you can do is create it right that's all you can do you create the plan and you simply follow through that's it so Number five is find the gap. Okay, cool. It's a retest gap. I want it to retest. My entry is going to be 217.16. I don't have to get very fancy. Why do I choose 217.16? Because that's the resistance line that I drew. That's my line. So if you don't use your line, who else's line are you going to use? I mean, if you don't trust yourself, you know, I mean, who else are you going to trust? It's like, if you got to do something else. Elvis says, what if it was a gap and go? That's a great question. If it was a gap and go, uh, I'm trying to find a, the most recent gap and go. Um, I'm just trying to look for one. I can't see one right now on NVIDIA, but if it was a gap and go, my entry would be above that, or I would hop into the hourly and find a more aggressive trade. Because gap and goes are, well, aggressive. So you're going to get a little bit more aggressive with the play. Right, because it might not retest. It gaps and then goes. It'll go faster. Uh, now, my stop. I mentioned if you are bullish, find a good bullish candle and place your stop below there. So this comes down to the number two thing that we talked about. You guys remember what's the number two thing that we talked about? Time frame. What is your time frame for the trade? That is up to you, my friends. I can't tell you that answer. That depends on how much money you got, how big your account is, what you're trying to do with your account, what's its purpose, what's its goal. I know we all want to make tons and tons of money. I get that. But it comes down to how much money do you have? What are you trying to trade? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish with it? If you need to pay the bills every 30 days, because intrinsically that's about how often I get my electricity bill. It's weird, right? About like every 30 days, I still got to pay, you know, pay stuff off. If it's rent or if it's mortgage or if it's car payment, right? Am I right? It's about every 30 days. So if you're trading foreign income, if that's what you're doing, which is not easy, but if that's what you're doing, then your time frame is probably shorter because you want to make that money quick. Okay. Jesse said they send you one every month. <laughs> right now they do. Yeah, presently. Presently, they, st they still send me a stupid bill every month. I know, it's weird. So if your time frame is shorter, then you're going to have a more aggressive stop. 
If your time frame is, uh, I got a job, I don't need this money, it's cool, let me just let this trade happen, then you can be a little bit more conservative. Let it, let it do its thing. Forget about the trade for two or three months. Two to three months. If you can make a 10% return in two to three months, it's insane, right? People will throw money at you. So you could either, and I'll, I'll put it on the chart, um, here's what my trade would look like. First of all, how would I get a trade uh, at 2.17.16? I would do a limit buy. Meaning I would be buying whatever instrument that I want. You could buy shares, you could buy options, you could buy whatever. So your limit buy would be 217.16. And then here's where I'll put your stops. It's kind of up to you where you want to put it. You can put your stop right here below that very nice bullish candle. That would be what I would refer to as a conservative stop. Not like your political viewpoint conservative, but as in you have a little bit more time on your hands. You don't need the money necessarily. You can be a little bit more conservative. And then you have aggressive as well. This is shorter time frames. You need to pay the bills, so on and so forth. Our answer is I assume swing trades generally take days to months. That is correct. Yeah. You are correct, Mundo. That's why I mentioned two to three months. That's a really good amount of time. So this will be the setup on NVIDIA. Now I know that this is hindsight. Now trust me, I'll, I'll find another one in a second. But I, I, I mentioned as many people as I possibly could that this was the setup on NVIDIA. This is the one, this is a very similar setup that we posted in our Slack channel to all the traders. Tons and tons and tons of people are hopping into this one. Um, here's the pullback on NVIDIA. Did we get triggered in? No, we did not, right? So back to the bounce. The bounce happens at usually the most inopportune times possible. You have to have the trade ready to go, already set up in order to get in on most bounces. It's a buy low, sell high. Ooh, RM. Hey, um, I'm, I gotta say this right up front. I need you in the room. I need that brain in the room. I love what you just did. Beautiful. So what RM was asking, and I'll, I'll copy and paste that question and put it in the chat pane to everybody. Um, RM was saying, can you combine the two and have half of your R at each stop? Yes, absolutely. So you could have half a stop here and half a stop here and um, have a full R of risk, but half an R on both. Beautiful job putting that together, but yeah. I do that um, on longer term stuff, a little bit longer term. Robert said you could also have your entries pyramiding in. Yep, you can do that as well. So in this situation, the bounce, if we go back to what I just said earlier, you never know if the bounce is going to happen or if it will work. All you can do is set up the trade based on your analysis and then let it do its thing. Give it some time, ladies and gentlemen. Please give it some time. Like days, weeks, it depends on how long, right, your time frame. At least give it two or three days. I mean, two or three days, come on. <laughs> if you're doing a swing trade. So the very next day on NVIDIA, it gapped down and it filled the gap. It gapped down and filled the gap. You wouldn't have had to be by the computer. Um, you wouldn't have had to do anything. You would have just simply hopped in. That would have been an automatic order that you would have gotten filled on. Does that make sense? Dylan, I will, another class another time, uh, explain pyramiding. So you would have had to been by the computer you could have been at work, you could have been on a cruise, you could have been on vacation, whatever. All you would have done is you would have set up the trade, walked away, and let it do its thing. Now for me, I personally let the stock trade for about a week before I move my stops. One week is pretty average for me. I give it a week, uh, five trading days, right at that. For the afternoon room, you'll see plenty of examples of that this week. I will be setting up trades this week, I'm sure. But I'll say, hey, you know, if this trade doesn't do X, Y, Z by February 1st, then I'll do X, Y, Z. So in this situation, um, on NVIDIA, I set it up. Elvis says, what about your target? Target's the least of your concerns. 
Target is the least of your concerns, my man. You want to make as much money as possible, right? So who cares about the target? Now I say that you can always have a target, right? But for the first few days, I don't just in case something amazing happens because those are the trades that I hold the longest. The trades I hold the longest are the ones that work immediately. So if I get into a trade and right out the gate, the trade starts working fantastic, I'm gonna hold that trade for a while. If I get into a trade and it's like, you know, a week and a half later, it's like I'm down or I'm up a little bit, then yeah, I'll set the target. But Elvis, I'm sure you might remember uh, in a lot of my other classes, I talk about the R strategy. So if one R is your risk, what's a good target? Yeah, there you go, man, two R's, two to three R's. So you just take your risk, you multiply it, and you put your target up there somewhere. GW says, for clarification, should we always be making sure to have a target when day trading? Um, even when I'm day trading, I normally don't set my target for 10 or 15 minutes, just in case you have a huge, crazy move come in and you can make more. I place my stops immediately, but my targets, I wait a little bit, just in case something amazing happens and I can get a little bit more. Great questions, by the way, folks. You're doing phenomenal. So what we did, let's say you wait a week. One, two, three, four, five. So there's five trading days. So five trading days on NVIDIA. Let me actually do this so that we can have a real fun time with this. Did that delete? Okay. So here's five trading days on NVIDIA. Uh, and here's my target, by the way, Elvis, if you're wondering. 25274 because it took about a week, right? It did its thing, so I ended up moving my target up a little bit. Where would you move your stop? It's a great question. If I had my stop as a conservative stop, I would move it to where my aggressive stop is. Right? That's where I would put it. If I had my aggressive stop, I would take my aggressive stop and put it right about there. Two Let's call it 217-ish. Because if you're conservative, you should probably be in this trade for two or three months anyway, so it's like, whatever. But at this level, again, if you are investing in the trade, like you wanna own NVIDIA for the next few years, you're probably using something called protective puts, right? Instead of using stops, you're using protective puts. But if you, that's the, if you wanted to invest in the stock long-term, like months and months and years and years, right? You're probably not gonna use stops. But if you are trading, just swing trading, whatever, you're probably gonna use your stops and then you would move up the stop a little bit from, uh, from, from well. Scott says, are those terms kind of reversed? Conservative means less risk, aggressive means more risk. So the higher the stop is less aggressive in a bullish trade, no. Um, I can see how you think that. No, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. But when I do my stop, Scott, remember all I'm doing is I'm risking 1%. I'm risking 1% on every trade that I do, all right? That's one R. It's one R. So the risk is the exact same amount for both of these. Let me give you an example. Scott, what's 1% of your account? What number would that be? Cool, five hundos. So let's take 217, 16 minus 210, 50. And what we're gonna come up with is the stop value for this trade. That stop value, uh, 6.66. So you take 500, you divide it by $6.66, and you're gonna come up with 75 shares. So 75 shares, that would cost you, like this would be the amount that you have to spend $16,291. That's how much money you're going to put into the trade. What is your risk mathematically? 500 bucks. Then I can do the exact same thing, 217.16 minus 203. 18 
equals $13.98. If I take 500 divided by 13.98, comes up with 35 shares. You see how I get the conservative versus the aggressive? Conservative, you have a little bit less shares. The investment size is a little bit less. Your stop's a little bit wider, but your risk is still 500 bucks for both. Karanga says, don't you have to adjust the amount if you are doing other trades or are we using margin? Uh, I mean, that entirely depends. So in this particular trade, um, Scott mentioned that he has a $500 R, which means his account is 50,000. So he could take four or five of these trades pretty easily, right, Garanga, and still have 50K left over. I think I might have said that wrong, but he can still trade 16,000, so I have plenty of money left. Now, if he ever wants to lower his R, he could do that. Or again, if you have margin, when you trade on margin, you can trade with 100,000 in that particular situation. So it just kind of depends. Well, it's a valid question. So on NVIDIA, one would simply, you know, if you're aggressive, you would just take the stop, and put it there. And if you're conservative, you take the stop and put it there. And then we would, we're gonna go forward a day or two and here's real time on NVIDIA. By the way, Corey, are you still here? So Corey was asking me earlier today, should he hold his NVIDIA? And uh, being in the room, Corey's already up more than he would have been if he sold. I hope you stay in the trades longer, my friends. If there's anything I can do, I can help you get in trades and hold it. Because this is a really pretty trade. I don't see any reason for it to stop for right now. Gronk says, but when assessing the stock value, you only consider your own money, not what you can trade on margin. Um, that depends. It's the exact same. So, you know, if you, two, if you have a $50,000 account, Gronga, and um, you have $100,000 of margin, 2% of this amount is the same thing as 1% of that amount. Am I right? So it, it's, the same, it's the same number, um, so it, it doesn't really matter. Again, if you wanna use a smaller risk, you always can do that. There's no, there's no problem with using, if you wanna use 0.38% of risk, whatever number you're comfortable with. Um, Rick says, how do you get 16,000 to trade on a $5,000 account? Uh, so 1% of a $5,000 account is how much, Rick? Yeah, there you go. So $5,000 account, you'd have a $50 R. And you can do this exact trade with, 50, with five grand too. Let's, let's go back for a second and figure out how many shares you would be in with a $50 R. Put this here, put this here. So don't tell me that you can't trade NVIDIA without, without a big account. That's, that's a baloney sandwich. 217, 16 minus 210, 50 equals Again, $6.66. If you took $50 and divided by 6.66 equals what? Seven shares. Seven and a half shares. You can do seven or eight, up to you. You can do seven or you can do eight. Uh, so let's just say you do eight. Eight times 217 equals 1,736 bucks. Get out of town. You got a $5,000 account, you can't trade stocks. That is a lie that someone told you. That is bogus, my friends. Here is a true story from a true guy who trades stocks a lot. If you are trading options because you have a small account and you're losing money, trade shares. Trade shares. Because if you cannot trade shares profitably, you will not be able to trade options profitably. Simple as that. So you can have a $5,000 account and trade NVIDIA or Apple or Tesla. You might not buy that many shares, but the amount of shares is irrelevant. I mean, who cares? Let's, let's be real honest with each other, okay? If you bought one share of Amazon at 40 and it's not $1,300, Congratulations. Am I right? It doesn't matter how many shares you're buying. Daniel says, but you can't day trade with a $5,000 account. That is 100% correct. You cannot. But you can trade shares. 
on a five thousand dollar account on stocks like Nvidia or Tesla or whatever. Now, on a side note, Daniel, um, there are many ways you can day trade with a five thousand dollar account. You can, as I mentioned earlier, you can take twenty five hundred of that and you can get into the hedge fund. You can day trade options. You can have a five thousand dollar account and only day trade cash. You can trade CFDs. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can trade a five thousand dollar account. Day trade a five thousand dollar account. If you do it and you have a cash account, you can only day trade until your cash is gone and you will have problems running into buying power with more expensive stocks. I get that. Um, Greg says you can trade futures with 5K as well. Yep, you can do futures. So that's just, that's trading, tr trading shares. Michael is trading stock. Are you familiar with that? Uh, Garanga CFDs, you can't trade them anyway because you live here in the US. So. I do have a video, but you can't trade them anyway. <laughs> Unless you want to move to a different country, we don't have them. So no US brokers offer CFDs. That is the answer to that question. Yeah. You can go into the UK, you can move to a different country, Canada, but if you're in the United States, can't do it, good try. So anyway, that was an analysis on NVIDIA. Um, let's do another one. I'm trying to think of another bounce that's approaching. Let's look at Shopify. Oh, and then I'm gonna look at Square. Um, Bob, and I'll answer your question. Let's, let's just look at Shopify. This is an expensive stock. Bob says, please run the math again. On an R, how do you determine the number of shares? Account size 20K, R of 200. Um, so let's, so Bob, let me, um, let me first of all send you guys this article. This is trading the R's. Uh, this is the same concept that I teach in class two of my beginners program. That's correct. This is class two of my beginners. That's how important this is. If somebody wants to learn how to trade stock correctly, I teach them how to trade in the second class. But I will do another example. By the way, just looking at Alcoa, check this out. Talking about the bounce, look at this trade. From 41 to 52, holla at your boy. Woo, that's dirty. That is dirty. Mm. Uh, so here's my thoughts on Alcoa going forward. Um, I'll pull up another chart. Uh, Alcoa will retest old resistance, new support. And we're gonna look at Shopify, and I'm gonna look at Square, and then we're gonna be done. So let me just pull up, since we were talking about Alcoa, here's what I think Alcoa is gonna do. And again, this is based on um, the chart and the gap and the trend and old support, new resistance, all the stuff that we just talked about. So if we come over here, this is January 18th analysis on Alcoa. So that was not that long ago, four days ago. And this is an example of how to start planning for the dip. So you'll notice this little pink line that's based on a bearish gap and go. This is old resistance, new support right there. Do you have a location that you could look to buy the dip off of, ladies and gentlemen? The answer is yes. Old resistance, new support. Will it work? Who knows? That's not for us to decide. What we can decide is, can we create our analysis and determine where we could buy that? Shaz asks, how long is a gap valid for? Um, about four to five months, usually. All right, cool. So that's Alcoa, that's what I think Alcoa is gonna do. Um, and so far, it's not too far off, we're just hanging out. Steve says, do you trade gaps later in the afternoon? Of course, that's how I do most of my swing trades, Steve. I hope you all show up for the afternoon swing trading room. It's from five to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's entirely free all week long. And I will be emailing out the recording. Trust me, I'm gonna blow your minds. I'm gonna keep doing it. Get your tissues ready. So let's look, let's go look at Shopify. Which, by the way, there's a lot of real life traders in Shopify right this second. Let's just practice how you could get into Shopify with a twenty thousand dollar account. First and foremost, how do we determine this is a old resistance, new support? Anyone want to help me with that? Matthew says, it started at five or six. 
Matthew Duxbury. It goes from 5 p.m. Eastern until 6 p.m. Eastern. That's 60 minutes. Scott says, what was step three in the trade setup sequence? Step three is determine support and resistance. And that's step four. Step three is make sure it's a company that you know how they work, you know how they're invested in, right? You know what they do. That's always a fun additional step. It keeps you in trades longer. Carlos says, the morning session recording, being recorded also. Yes. Tim Stout. There we go, brother. Tim says, the big black can on the left. Type in a four if you were here for my Wealth 365 program. That wasn't just a bunch of malarkey, by the way. That's a legit way of how I trade. Look at this nice, big, long day bearish candle. Top of bearish candle acts as old resistance. Look at this. Look at this. Look how well that acts. Are you kidding me? So good. Steven, how about I just email you a copy of today's recording? Is that fair? Uh, so you have old resistance, new support. So this would be your limit. This would be where you buy on a pullback. Question, my friends, do we know if this trade would work? Yes or no? No, that's not the point. We never know if it's going to work. Now, it depends on where you want to have your stop. If you had your stop all the way the heck down here, that's real conservative. That's fine if you want to do it, but that is real conservative. That's like 20 points. But hey, if you want to be real conservative, that's cool. Uh, I would say a stop right here is conservative. It might be a little bit a blend between conservative and aggressive. And then an aggressive stop would just be right below these strong bullish candles. This would be, I would just say, more aggressive. So Bob Hubbard from Nashville, Tennessee. Let's talk about where and how much you could do the math of this trade. So you come up with your R. You mentioned your R is 200. So you come up with a stop value. Again, the good news, guys, is this is first grade math in any country, maybe even kindergarten. Very simple. Well, maybe not kindergarten. That's a little bit aggressive, third grade math. <laughs> I didn't even learn colors until I was in seventh grade, so it, it takes time. So you come up with your stop value, which is your entry minus stop. So in this situation, 116.81 minus 110.80. Uh, and for easy numbers, we can make it 110.81. Does anyone want to do that math for me? It should be pretty simple, pretty easy to do. Uh, Daniel, too much for right now. Yep. Too much for right now. So the difference between those two numbers is $6. You guys follow me how I got that so far? I'm taking my entry and I'm subtracting the stop value. 100 divided by 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 um, I would still take this trade, Chaz, because this will be target number one right here. I would exit a little bit right there, and then I would hope for some higher movements afterwards. Michael Cruz says, simple math. It's pretty easy, guys. It's not that hard. Now, here's the funny part. Type in a one if you've never seen this anywhere else other than real life trading. This is the scary part. The amount of people who don't teach risk mitigation is asinine. It is horrifically bad. Why don't other people teach this? Honestly, it's because they're usually pretty terrible and horrible traders themselves, or they're just trying to sell you something and make you think that you can buy a Lamborghini with all the trades or whatever it is. But this is just common, common practice in real life trading. There is never a day where everyone just blows up their account and they lose tons of money. Elvis says, would, would you wait for a retest of that setup? Yes, sir. That is why I typed in limit buy, right? I'd be waiting for a pullback, a retest. Does that make sense, Elvis? I want to retest because you have four white candles in a row. So I just wanted to boop, old resistance, new support. That's what this whole discussion is about. It's called the bounce, right? How do you know when the bounce is coming? 
you simply create it and you set up based on old resistance, new support, or moving average, or whatever it is. Tons and tons of questions. I love it. We got two minutes left, and then we're done, folks. Sorry. Good thing we have a whole week, right? So here's Square. And what I would do on Square is I would look to, uh, and I haven't filled this out yet. Just give me a few, few seconds. Okay, if you wanted to take square, this would be an aggressive stop. I feel like, well, not super aggressive, but pretty aggressive. And this would be conservative, and this would be the entry right here. Limit sell. And that would be the setup right there, if you're looking at trading it. How did I get that price? I mean, it's about 50% of that candle uh, and it's simply retesting some resistance or is it upper shadow? You could put it lower. It's up to you. That's where the more art than science comes in. You have the entry here right on top of this giant bearish candle. That's not a bad trade. Maybe lower your stop a little bit. Will that trigger? Maybe it will, maybe not. I, I really have no idea. The thing is though with square, Sorry, I didn't mean to type in limit buy. Yes, apologies. Uh, limit buy, because you're looking you're looking at it doing this. Boop boop. Ash says, with a limit buy for stop, is it a day order? Not a good till cancel order. Is it good till cancel order, Ash? Because you're swing trading. All right, you want to catch it tomorrow, maybe Wednesday, maybe Thursday. Matthew says, sorry about this question, but I'm not able to make it to your morning session that starts at eight because I have to work at eight. Is there any way I can grab a recording? Yes, I'll be emailing out today's recording, uh, but I only record the morning room once a month because it's kind of irrelevant to, run, to record the morning room because all the trades are done by the time you get to recording. But I do email out an afternoon recording every single day. Um, so on Square, Here was the most recent analysis that we did, um, at least two or three analysis, and then we're done. So back on November 28th, well, let's start with November 14th first. So November 14th, this was my target on Square that a lot of real life traders used to capture a nice little gain, 46.78. Michael says, how can we get in on the goodness of the afternoon recording? I will email it to you, my friends. Keep an eye on your inbox. So that's a pretty good target. Would you guys agree? That's not that bad. It's not too shabby. Sure, I could have caught an additional $2, but, you know, things happen. This is end of year target, meaning I, I was very confident that Square would hit this price before the end of the year and sell off. I mean, come on, guys. Is that not is that not worth something to have that kind of help? That's got to be worth a little bit of something. So then, the next analysis on Square was this is November twenty eighth. This chart right here by itself is worth thousands, however much you want it to be worth. When I drew this, now obviously I can't draw and I can't predict the future to uh, to an exact measurement, but. What I was saying is there's going to be a little bit of a consolidation, a rest, a small move lower, and then a continuation higher in 2018. I mean, that is it right there. So my plan was that it would consolidate, trade higher, and then bounce, which is what it did. Not too bad. And then of course, this one, two, three days ago, I was like, this is it guys, this is the dip. This is the bounce, right? This is the bounce. Trade goes up, it pulls back into the moving averages. If the trend is bullish, you buy the dip. That's what you do. This is it, right? This is the dip, so you gotta get in. That was back at 39 and some change. We're at 45, that's $6. If you bought six, if you bought 100 shares, that's 600 bucks. That's double your car payment, probably. That might even be your rent or close to your mortgage, depending on, I don't know. If you bought 1,000 shares, that's six grand. 
in four days. Ladies and gentlemen, all I can tell you is real life trading is the best program on the planet. I'm a little partial, but I truly believe it. Folks, you are amazing. I will see you in the afternoon from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sorry, you guys rock. I'll see you then. And until next time, love life, live life, and trade it. Bye-bye.